Hello and welcome to the fourth event in the series Encounters, New Perspectives on Asia, America and Europe, a joint initiative of the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg University and also here at Heidelberg University, the Heidelberg Center for American Studies. My name is Rael Ferner, I am the director of the HCA. The events in this series focus on the relationship between the two superpowers of the 21st century, the United States of America and the People's Republic of China, a relationship that has become increasingly contentious. China's growing self-confidence is a challenge for the US and its allies alike and thus also embroils Europe in this new trans-Pacific geopolitical rivalry. We are convinced that we need to know more about these two nations that will shape the world of the 21st century and their complex relationship. For today's encounter, my collaborator in this project, Barbara Mittler, will talk to the former Taiwanese Minister of Culture, Lung Ying Tai. The question we are posing today is Enfen Tarib, Minister of Culture or silent loner. Although most of you are probably familiar with Professor Mittler and her distinguished career, please allow me to introduce her briefly. Barbara Mittler studied at the universities of Oxford, Taipei and Heidelberg. Since 2004, she has been a professor of Chinese studies at Heidelberg University, where she co-founded the cluster of excellent Asia and Europe in a global context in 2007 and building on this the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies CATS, which opened in 2019. She has been a fellow and visiting professor at the Academia Sinica in Taiwan, at the Humanities Center for, uh, of Stanford University and the EHESS in Paris. Her research focuses on Chinese cultural politics, particularly on Chinese music, the early press, the cultural revolution, and issues of image and text in the formation of cultural memory. Barbara Mittler is currently heading two projects, the China School Academy, a project of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, which produces teaching and learning materials for school subject teaching on China and the Heidelberg part of the BMBF Collaborative Research Center on Epochal Life Worlds, which together with international fellows investigates the interplay of humans, nature and technology in moments of collapse and the critical transitions that shape historical epochs. Barbara, we are looking forward to your conversation with Long Ying Tai, but first to your introduction of our distinguished guest. Thank you very much, Welf, and um, I will continue by um, actually introducing the person who is the star of this uh, dialogue, of this encounters uh, series today, Long Ying Tai. Um, and I, I begin with a quote. In 1975, when I went to the US for the first time, she says, I went to the library. And by chance, I got a book about Chinese history. That opened my eyes and I thought, oh my God, what I was told were all lies. And that is what our guest of honor today, Long Ying Tai writer, literary critic and public intellectual remembers from her first stay in the US. Ever since she's been on the lookout for writing hidden truths. And because of that, Long Ying Tai not only has a large number of devoted readers in her native Taiwan, but her works um, also in the Chinese language, uh, are also read in the Chinese language worlds in Hong Kong, the People's Republic of China and North America. Long Ying Tai entered public service as the Taipei city government's first minister of culture in 1999, and she served as Taiwan's inaugural Minister of Culture from 2012 and 14. And from there, she went on to Hong Kong in 2015, where before her resignation in 2020, she was Hong Leong Haoling Distinguished Fellow in Humanities at the University of Hong Kong. Now, Long Ying Tai is the author of more than two dozen books, 
including essays, fiction, reportage, liter literary criticism. She um, wrote in 1985 a book entitled Wildfire, which created a major cultural stir for its honest and introspective look at the social and political problems facing Taiwan society at the time, at the time when Taiwan was still a dictatorship. Long Ying Tai remembers how during that time her father would call her every day just to make sure that she had not been taken away by government spies for publishing her controversial column of wildfire, which later become, became that important book. Um, and that column was published in China Times in a daily, um, and her essays, which basically criticized the Orwellian conditions in Taiwan government corruption, human rights violations, punched milk power, and so on and so forth. Um, they've been considered these essays milestones in the history of democratization. Taiwan, um, as said, remained um, uh, under martial law until 1987. Um, and uh, her essays were important push to uh, actually stop that and to democratize Taiwan. And they were also read during the democracy movement on the other side of the Taiwan Straits on Tiananmen Square in Beijing in 1989, which can no longer be remembered in Hong Kong since 2020 when she resigned for that reason, among others, from Hong Kong U. Um, Long Ying Tai was born on Taiwan as the daughter of parents who came from the mainland, from Hunan actually, from Mao's native province. Um, she was educated in the US and resident of Europe where she raised her two sons, um, actually very close to Heidelberg. And um, she was also teaching at Heidelberg for a, a long time. One of my first teachers of Taiwan literature. Um, in Hong Kong, finally, where she uh, spent the last um, uh, five or six years, she observed the growing pains of that special administrative region, as she put it. And uh, she has developed her distinct voice of cultural criticism informed by global perspectives from that very sort of itinerant um, uh, lifestyle that she's been leading. And she's never stopped calling on those around her in Europe, in North America, as well as in different parts of China. Where is your outrage? That was the title of her first piece, addressing her fellow Chinese citizens. Another, please show me your civility, would speak to those at the top of the political echelons in the People's Republic of China. In this case, it was Hu Jintao, who would close the Freezing Point magazine in 2006, one of the first steps in eliminating the possibility of voicing journalist and criticism in the mainland. Her voice continues to be heard even as she resigned from Hong Kong University and moved into another well-established position of the Chinese public intellectual that we'll talk about later. Um, and that uh, basically is described by this epithet, silent loner, the silent loner practicing solitude um, as in her most recent work, Practice of Solitude, Zou Lu. Um, her voice as well as her silence continues to resonate today on both sides of the Taiwan Straits and controversially so. And even if many of her writings are forbidden on the mainland, they circulate nevertheless in clandestine copies. There's still a lot of people in the waiting room. Could you admit them, please? Um, in her interventions, she connects the private and the public as in her 2009 documentary novel, Big River, Big Sea, the story of a war. This is the story of the civil war that killed 10 million people um, in uh, China and that forced a mass exodus and divided many families across the Taiwan Straits. Her older brother, whom she meets for the first time in 1985, remains on the mainland while her parents flee from the Communist People's Liberation Army to Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek, who would reign as a dictator um, for many decades to come in Taiwan. Now, this novel, Da Jiang Da Hai, Big River, Big Sea, is not the story of a particular war. It tells the story of war more generally, one uh, that is especially pertinent uh, today as we see a war waging very close in Europe, the cruelty of war. So in Da Jiang Da Hai, in Big River, Big Sea, uh, Long Ying Tai captures the suffering of being in a war from the perspective of individuals, ordinary people, families, thus counteracting the propaganda 
of both sides, something that resonates, I think, with everyone today, both in the US and in Europe and in China, as we watch the unfolding of the war against Ukraine. If we continue, I quote her, to be the unthinking cogs in a machine, and then how do you know whether these tragic misfortunes would not be repeated? Well, unfortunately, they are being repeated as we speak, as her book is being translated into Ukrainian at this very moment with her translator on the run. Now, in this fourth installment of Encounters, we will probe into questions of democracy, civility, and war, and how they can be approached from a Chinese writer's point of view, a Chinese public intellectual's point of view. So, first question to you, Inkai, uh, as a global intellectual, um, as you grew up in Taiwan, um, born to mainlander parents under Jiang Kai-shek, um, and as you relate, and I began with that in 1975 when you went to the US, that you found out that all you had known as history was lies. To what extent does this realization of lies everywhere determine your life path as a writer and as a global intellectual? Uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Uh, on the left? Okay. Yes, cool. Okay. Thank you, Barbara, for the really, um, in such a time, a comprehensive uh, introduction. Um, I want to say something to Professor Werner first, because we meet first time online. I want to tell you that uh, Heidelberg has a very special place in my heart. All the years I was there, uh, it meant something that's very close to my heart. And therefore, when I say that I'm so delighted to be here today, it's not a polite uh, rhetoric for two reasons. One, Heidelberg is special to me for personal reasons. And number two, uh, the, the focus of the series is um, somehow the interconnectedness or the relationship between Europe, US, and the Chinese-speaking world. I would say if you want to look for a Chinese speaking uh, intellectual who has been hugely um, inspired by her experiences both in the US and in Europe, I probably am a very good specimen. Um, so um, that is, I spent almost nine years in the United States, 13 years in Europe, and then plus nine years in Hong Kong and so on. Okay, so um, the first question is about um, how I discovered when I was in my early 20s that um, my education had contained so, so many lies that occurred in a university library in, um, in, Heidel uh, in, no, in Ohio. Um, and that really opened my eyes. So I think the US experiences have inspired many uh, young aspiring scholars, intellectuals from around the world. And that is also the strength of the US. And I hope that US will keep its doors open because that's the best way to really the, um, to create impact on the rest of the world. But speaking of lies, um, I would think back, okay, I'll start with the Time magazine. The first time I laid my eyes on a copy of Time magazine, I think when I was 13 in the countryside, and why would I remember a copy of the Time magazine from that young age? It's because this magazine was lying on the, on the, on the table, um, but someone has, has used a uh, a marker pen and scratch out the headlines and blotted out the photos. So what happened was at that time, that was the time when the GIO, that means Government Information Office of Taiwan, they check every single copy of imported magazines. And this, a, a civil servant uh, is charged with the task of 
crossing out each and every line and improper photos. So I believe the photo that I saw when I was 13, which was blotted out, uh, must have been a photo of Mao Zedong, for example. Um, so you can imagine that some 40 years later, uh, I work in the Ministry of Culture, and I was tasked to dismantle this government information office, which was actually a ministry of propaganda during the martial law era and turned, turned it into a ministry of culture in a democratic system. So that was my job 40 years later. In 1975, when I was studying in the US, I discovered that the education I'd received um, contains so many lies. And 10 years later, in 1985, I wrote uh, Wildfire, which is a collection of uh, socio political critique. And I wrote it with the intention of functioning as a needle to puncture, to, to, to punch holes in a balloon at that time. So it was uh, with intention to write that, um, that volume. And and Barbara was right uh, when you say that my, when I look back with, at my trajectory as a writer, probably unwittingly, this urgent um, sense, the calling that uh, I have to discern uh, um, lies in the labyrinth of lies, I have to find out how to get out of that. It somehow really has become a kind of a light motif in the whole life path of me as a writer. But the critical thing, the interesting thing, in the 1980s, when we, when I was, and many other colleagues, we were writing and working against that half-baked dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek's regime. I particular to an autocracy. And only after Taiwan has earned democracy late in the 1980s, then I discovered no, lies are not particular to an autocracy because democracy lies as well, only in a different way. So um, we've been naive or I've been naive before. And therefore there comes the, uh, uh, the, the um, realization that to detect and to expose lies is an ongoing process. It's not that one thing that you achieve and then you get it, you don't get it. It's an ongoing process. I came to realize that every generation, therefore, has to learn about lies and truths anew. You always start anew. Every generation has to start anew. At this discovery, I was kind of a kind of frustrated, disappointed, but, but you have seen so many in, um, in the same, at the same time. So I have, I have resigned to this fact, that is that human memories are really very short. And most part of human history has been repetitions, be it atrocities, which were, we are witnessing again now, or heroism, be it lies or truths, and therefore every generation has its own battles to fight. Speaking, of uh, I was speaking that every generation right. has its own battles to fight. Right. Every generation has to work out uh, mm -hmm. the problem, the issue of lies and truths, because human human history repeats itself. A large part of it is repetition. And therefore, every generation has to work on the same core issue, only with different scenarios. So every generation has to work on the issues anew. So when, right. So when in the 1980s, you were writing wildfires, um, yeah. there, <laughs> there you were very courageous. Because at that point in time, Taiwan was not a democracy. And mm -hmm. there were death threats for doing what you were doing. What gave you mm -hmm. the courage to go against the current, basically in the eye of the storm? How 
did you take up that courage? Yeah, how, did, how could I know that I was right? <laughs> right. Okay, so you asked me when I spoke up against uh, the, the then current as that is cool, how did I know how? How did you know that you were right? How could I know that I was right? Right. I'm going to answer, but I'm not sure if the voice carries or carries over. Right. Okay. And here, um, the U.S. comes in to play again. You know, I grew up in Taiwan in an, in an island. So when we look around us, uh, east and west, north and south, we saw one thing: that's water. That's the, the Pacific Ocean, and water was a dangerous thing because as children, we were told the common, communist would swim over and come up, crawl up from the water and kill you. And so I went to the United States in 1975. Mm -hmm. You went to the United States in 1975 and now we don't hear you. Anymore. And the first time okay. I crossed the border into China, I walked. Uh, I went to Canada the first time from the state of Washington. Is the sound okay? Yeah, now it's good from the state of Washington. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I crossed the bridge. I walked and crossed the bridge on foot. Then I was told that I was in Canada. Oh. Uh, I stood on the soil of Canada, standing there, totally dumbfounded because how could you possibly cross the border? without crossing the water. You know, where is the water? In other words, to answer your question in a, in a, in a cursive way, I would say, how, how did I know I was right when, when I was, was my writing, I was fighting against the status quo? I knew I was, was, I was right because I had the privilege of seeing other borders. I went to other borders. This is like people escape from Plato's uh, caves mm -hmm. and you see things under different sunlight. In this sense, yes, uh, the U.S. experience has been very important in kind of opening up my eyes and knowing I was right. Okay, Barbara? and uh, you, you've just alluded uh, to the Plato's scene in the cave um, and I'm going to allude to another scene of uh, encavement uh, by Lu Xun. Yeah because Lu Xun, one of the greatest modern writers that actually you probably didn't know anything about in your childhood because in Taiwan, you were censored, well, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Lu Xun um, uh, writes um, uh, uh, also a collection of, of short stories called not wildfires, but called Call to Arms. Um, and he basically, uh, he changed his destination. He was originally going to become a doctor, um, but he uh, realized that becoming a doctor doesn't really help the Chinese people because you don't have to change the bodies of the people, you have to change their minds. And this uh, seems to me, um, and he, he then talks about, you know, the, the scene in an iron house when everybody yeah. is asleep. Um, uh, does it make sense to call to them? and wake them up so that maybe there is a chance that they will escape from that iron house and not all die. And he decides, yes, I'm going to write call to arms. I'm going to call out to people. And in a way, you know, that's the um, intellectual in sort of the Chinese tradition has this, uh, this, this duty to care for the people, to help the people, to cry out to the people. Um, and you are also taking up this role time and again. Um, my question to you, do you enjoy that role? Um, and is there actually room for such a role today? Um, how important is it to be a writer, to be such an intellectual, to call out to the people yeah. today? Well, if you, you ask me if I enjoy the role, having been the so-called uh, the one who enlightens, it's very hard for me to answer because, you know, when you write against those in power, whether it be the person or, or the government really in power, or actually the uh, tyranny of the masses of the so-called public opinion, um, you are always loved by some 
and hated by others. And it's never a pure enjoyment. So I have learned to take verbal abuses for granted, you know, through, through the years. Um, and so as, as to the question whether such a role with the public intellectual being the enlightenment, like the beacon uh, bearer today, I think there is a very fundamental change in that role. Um, in an oppressed society, uh, where there's no freedom of speech, as in Taiwan before 1987, and in China still to this day, intellectuals acted like, if I have to make a comparison, in an oppressed, uh, suppressed society, intellectuals or writers acted like a barefoot uh, uh, doctor in a remote village, 视角, where um, everything is inadequate and therefore this barefoot doctor, she has to act as uh, a surgeon to operate uh, and at the same time a psychiatrist. Uh, she has to be the midwife perhaps and sometimes she has to be the corona studying, examining dead bodies. Um, since they were, there are no other outlets, so people find inspiration, consolation, and even uh, Cassandra type of prophecies from the writer. So the writers, intellectuals, they are overburdened with, with these uh, expectations. But this all important role, I think becomes very much weaker when democracy is really established because those elected uh, representatives with the system, they are supposed to uh, carry this function on their shoulders. And therefore the writers as, as, the, as the overall important um, uh, mouthpiece of people's hearts, the function is not there anymore. And then today, uh, the, the, the role of the qi mongzhi, or the one who enlightens, actually is further seriously weakened by this uh, internet age. During our internet age, so the barrier to knowledge is much lowered, it's open, open to everybody, and also the, the hurdle to gaining influences is also lower, so much lowered that Mr. Everybody has, has an amplifier to his or her voice anywhere. So I think the role of the public intellectual has thus been really uh, fundamentally changed in a way that the world still needs quote unquote prophets. But if you want to be prophets today, you have to be able to see further, farther into the future standing on a much higher ground than you used to before. Because on the lower ground, where the intellectuals used to be, now it's packed with internet influencers. So if you want, if the writer or intellectual still want to play the role of the enlightenment, uh, you have to be able to stand on even higher ground today. I lose your voice again. This is my fault. You do this um, with um, Da Jiang Da Hai. You are mm -hmm. stepping into this role, it seems to me. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it, it is amplified even when it's mm -hmm. censored, for example, in mainland China. It's been um, banned for 10 years. Exactly. It's been banned for a long time. And so I want to ask you a little bit about that book, um, uh, which is read by millions of Chinese readers all over different parts of China, in spite of the fact that it's being banned. Um, what are the different types of receptions that the book gets from the, these different Chinese speaking communities? Um, why is the book banned? Um, and why is it an underground bestseller nevertheless? <laughs> why is banned? I, I really hope that one day this ban will be lifted. Um, uh, it, it, that, that, that high, or the Big River Big Sea is actually, um, I think it's an underground bestseller for about for 10 years. Um, but anyway, yes, I understand the reason why it's banned. Um, the, the, the narrative of the Chinese Civil War of, the night, of 1949, uh, canonized by the Communist Party, has been, has, has been this, that this is 
uh, the Civil War of 1949 is a is as a war of liberation where the revolutionaries eliminated the nationalists, um, and it's the revolutionaries, the communists. Through this war, they were able to found a new nation, the People's Republic China, for the well-being of the masses. So this is the base, the, the base of the grand narrative about the civil war. And because of this very noble uh, aim, which has been achieved, so all the massacres, the bloodshed, um, were cloaked in the language of glorification. So despite 10 to uh, 30 million lives were lost during the Civil War, this war was depicted in Chinese textbooks through the ages uh, as a noble struggle between the good versus the bad, the just versus the corrupt, um, to be something to be celebrated to this day. Okay, so for the reader, for the Chinese, mainland, mainland Chinese readers who came across Big River, Big Sea for the first time, uh, it's a painful experience of shock because they, for the first time, they are confronted with a totally different version of the very basis of the nation that they love. Um, Take, for instance, um, the chapters on the siege of Changchun. Changchun is a city, a big, big city in uh, northeast China. So it's been reported in, data, in, in local newspapers that whenever a, uh, a, a new building was being planned and the digging would begin, oftentimes the um, large numbers of bones would be discovered under the surface of the city uh, in many in many spaces. So um, Big River, Big Sea tells the story of the siege. Um, reportedly, after the 1948 uh, siege, um, the, the, commun the communist troops surrounded the, uh, the city for six months. Um, allegedly, between 200,000 to half a million people starved to death in the city. And when I went to Changchun to do my story, we hired a driver, a local driver, a young man. And so he took us from place to place. And then of course he learned what I was looking for. And so after he told the story, he refused to believe it because he said he was born there and grew up there. There's no way uh, that could have happened. Um, 200,000 200, to half a million people starved to death in 1948. So in front of our eyes, he called up his old uncle and we witnessed the whole conversation on the phone. He called up his old uncle who was in his eighties. So his uncle from the other, other end of the telephone told him all the tragic details of the siege of the city and he was speechless. So this anecdote um, I use this simply to explain to you um, why this book was banned and uh, why the mainland Chinese readers still want to read this book. You don't have to accept the viewpoint of the book, but these are documented facts. And um, there's no finger pointing in the book. Actually, this is a book crying out for peace. And as it is a book for peace, um, the message that you're getting across very, very um, impressively is that in a civil war where brothers kill brothers, uh, you must cry out for peace. There must be peace somehow. Um, and uh, the, the hidden wounds of one's enemy um, are just as important as the wounds of myself. So the demonization of the other uh, cannot really be done, right? Uh, because it will lead to continuous wars. Um, and in a way, um, uh, we had a very, very um, uh, touching um, uh, encounter with you uh, a couple of years ago when we had students um, impersonate um, some of the dialogues in Datyang uh, Dahai, in uh, Big River, Big Sea, um, uh, that they had translated um, themselves. Um, and during that meeting in 2016, 
um, you told us that um, really one of the most important things uh, in uh, if, that you learned somehow you know, from, from writing this book or that was maybe behind the writing this book is that you need uh, to listen uh, to each other. Uh, to, you even need to listen to your enemy's voice. Now, in a day like this, uh, during days like this, uh, during the Ukrainian war uh, or the war with the Ukraine, um, can one say something like that? Is it politically correct? to call uh, for silence, to listen to the other. You know, Barbara, I happened to be in Vienna in March when this Ukrainian war was waging on. And uh, even when I, I drove to Slovakia, to Slovenia, to Italy, Croatia, and all along the way, I saw refugees mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the preparations uh, of materials to help the refugees out. I actually watched this unfolding of the Russian-Ukrainian war with, with, with pain in my heart because um, I found myself reliving what I was writing in this book of 1949. Um, people who could speak the same language, who actually probably came from the same villages, sharing part of the same history, having... Oh, we are losing you again. So they're sharing the same history? Family members living across, yeah, sharing part of the same history, having family members living across on the other side of the border. I think the Germans and the Chinese know this very well. Mm -hmm. um, it's painful to watch what's happening today. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was in, uh, in Europe and all this, all, all this uh, was unfolding, then I remembered, oh, uh, Big River, Big Sea is right in the process of being translated into Ukrainian. So I, uh, I got in touch with my translator and I talked to her and um, she said, well, they live uh, at the outskirts of, uh, of Kiev and she was just in the process of packing up because the next day, next morning, she was going to pack up her grandmother who was very old who used to refuse to leave home. This is, this, I wrote about this in my book, you know. And, and next morning they were going to pack up and they were going west. So on her way west, she sent me a photo of herself uh, in a war-torn uh, territory on the way to run and herself standing upright with the book. She is in the middle of translating and sent the photo to me. And what she said was she couldn't believe that what she was translating was the was all the bombing and the corpses and the family divided and all that. Uh, what she was translating is her reality today. So it was it's it's just surrealistic. Mm -hmm. But so if you ask me how is Big River Big Sea related to today, you know, looking at Ukraine. In the back of everybody's mind is Taiwan and China. And so the Chinese Civil War of 1949 has never ended. It has never ended. And we're still sitting on edge over the possibility of war. Mm -hmm. And people in Taiwan, are my friends, people I know, they are talking about, well, in case of an attack, what should we have at home, you know? Serials, uh, half serious, half jokingly, some cash because the ATM is not going to work, water, and so on. And, and, and then one, one, over, one dinner conversation, uh, one of us said, don't forget cat food and dog food. <laughs> no, because they are going to starve. <laughs> okay. so, um, the, so the cry for mutual understanding, for tolerance and for peace in the, the 
big river, big sea, is not from yesterday. This outcry is for today. So thinking about today, <laughs> um, I mean, for Taiwan, this is sort of a very touchy war, right? Not only because oh, yeah. of the parallels, um, but also um, because of the question whether Big Brother US is going to help you. Um, Biden said <laughs> something to this effect. <laughs> Maybe you could just briefly say what do you think? Oh, yes. <laughs> Of Savannah, uh, what I believe yeah. is <laughs> one should never trust politicians, <laughs> more government. And it's not that the politicians or President Biden try to lie. He might be speaking from his heart, but the problems international geopolitics has very little to do with how you feel and has little to do with your true values. It has a lot to do with, uh, uh, with real politic, the experience of what is required at that moment under that circumstance. So I'm not saying we should or should not trust what Biden said, it would come to the help of, of Taiwan. What I believe is Taiwan really has to I think Taiwan has to make a really dire effort for peace. And of course, it's ridiculous to talk about the striving for peace from, from the, 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 the smaller part. It, it should come from Beijing. It, I think the politicians, the leaders in Beijing should come out and say how peace, how important peace is absolutely is. And then Taiwan will be in a better position to say, yes, we want peace too, and let's talk. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I, I think the issue is less in whether you believe in Biden or whether you believe in the US or not, because that part is gonna change anytime as the wind blows. So it's the Taiwanese and the Chinese who really have to know what they want. But coming back to this, coming back to the um, question of the politician having to say what he has to say for real politics. You yourself yes. served as a politician, and <laughs> I'm always wondering how you balance the two roles I was. of the writer intellectual who is extremely critical towards the authorities, and that of the politician for whom compromise is the most important art of the game. How did you manage, both in 1999 mm -hmm. and then again, you know, in 2012 to 14, um, as Minister of Culture? Um, how did that work for you? It was, Barbara, it was easier when I was, uh, <clears throat> uh, was a minister of culture for the city mm -hmm. because there was less pure politics. Mm -hmm. there, were, there, were, there were a lot of room that, I, for example, I turned, I, I collapsed the building in, I, I, I turned into a historical site and I, I made it beautiful again. You know, you do something and then you see the beautiful outcome of it. But, once you get into the central government, to the Ministry of Culture, things became more unpleasant. There was so much uh, politics in there. It was hard to get things done. Um, compromises or, or the maneuvering uh, as a minister. I can, I'll give you one story. Um, you know, when we submit our budget, annual budget plan into the parliament, to the legislature, UN, um, it's expected that the opposition would try to block your budget. They were not supported. But supposedly, the parliamentarians from, from the ruling party should support you. But in my case, I realized not only the opposition was trying to block your plan, but the, uh, the parliamentarians from your, from, I'm not a party member, so from the ruling party, did not support my budget either. So it was this once I went into uh, <clears throat> the office of this female parliamentarian and uh, <clears throat> I asked her, why? I mean, this bi-party uh, uh, politics, the system works, you were supposed to support me, you know? So why not? And she laughed at, uh, she, she laughed at me. Literally, she laughed at me and looked me into the eyes and said, 
are you naive? Tell me why should I, or why should we support your budget plan? What have you given me in return? And what she meant, this, the lesson she gave me was, you know, uh, the parliamentarians, they have, they have to be elected too. And how do they get themselves elected? They have to, they have to be able to go to their constituency and claim that, see, it's because of my effort that this library is built. And it's through my effort that this, your road gets paved. And in order to have these credits, so she would want me to give her a slice of the pie of my budget mm -hmm. so that she can earn votes from her constituency. But my problem was, well, I did my, uh, cultural policy and the resource distribution professionally uh, of the national interest and your individual interest might, might not coincide with this professional cultural policy resource map, you know. Um, but then if I don't compromise, I won't get my budget through. Okay, so that's, that's the game, that's the game. And, um, so oftentimes I did not compromise and therefore I couldn't get things through. Um, now you ask me how I maneuver, I'd have to say that um, uh, it is a risky business for writers or intellectuals to get into government and, and become executive because uh, job as a minister really requires um, requires a totally different set of abilities from the talents that come natural to a writer or intellectual. In my case, for example, uh, I have to work, I have to provide leadership. I have to, I have to be able to work together with 2000 civil servants who rely on my decisions. I had to work and communicate with other department has other ministers because if you do not get understanding from uh, for example the ministry of labor or the ministry of transportation or minister even minister foreign ministry you get sabotaged so i learned um the art of cooperation and communication but i don't think i i, I was successful with the uh, legislators it was a painful lesson. <laughs> okay, so so you've taken on um, the several positions that a Chinese intellectual has to offer, right? You so you can be a Chen Shi or a Guan, you can be a minister, um, yeah. you can be a Qing Guan, a critiquing minister, um, sort of from mm -hmm. inside the government, um, and uh, then you can you can be, of course, uh, someone from below critiquing, which you did as enfant terrible in in the eighties, right? Um, and then there is a third position, and maybe we can speak a little bit about that third position as well. That's the position of the silent loner, right? Which, in a way, you are uh, taking up today. You, you, you wrote to me, keeping sane means being a loner. Um, so you've resigned from the government's position in December 2014, uh, then went to Hong Kong, um, and then came basically to uh, back to your quiet desk, if you want. Uh, uh, left Taipei, lived on, live on a farm uh, on the Pacific coast, um, and you're writing uh, novels um, now. Um, so nature in these novels seems to be your focus, um, and only very occasional do you comment on current affairs. Why? Why is this? Uh, why do you ex is are you escaping your responsibilities of the public intellectual? Is it deliberate that you are now a loner? Um, facing something that you consider far more important than the burning issues of the daily news. Why is it? Tell us a bit. Probably, about it. I'm not going to dodge your very <laughs> sharp questions, but I want allow me to go back a little bit to mm -hmm. previous question mm -hmm. uh, because I was being and I am being very critical of the Taiwanese democracy. I am. However, I think it is important to say this. Um, I must say that the Taiwanese, we have really come a long way in transitioning from 
a close society to an authentic, albeit imperfect democracy. We really have come a long way. There was one factor which I think is very much overlooked by international communities. That is that the Taiwanese has, have achieved so much progress, both politically and economically um, in a very short span, that's 70 years after World War II under continuous threat of war. You know, all this, we talk about uh, the microchips coming from Taiwan, which is indispensable for the world. We talk about democracies. We talk about the land reform, which has been done in Taiwan, success, successfully so on and so forth. Um, and Taiwan has achieved all this, this imperfect democracy under the constant threat of war. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And that is really not an easy task. So I, I really think the world should really appreciate the Taiwanese today. And I don't know what Professor Viana would think of it. I want to say that I, I think the world really should appreciate the Taiwanese not out of geopolitical expediency because, hey, the West is again entering a new wave of Cold War and therefore out of strategic experiences, experience, Taiwan is needed. I hope that that Taiwanese will be appreciated not because of this usefulness, but the Taiwanese should be praised, appreciated, and embraced in her own right, mm -hmm. looking at history. So that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> at the same time, I'm very critical of democracy today in Taiwan. Okay, now coming back to uh, the longer. <laughs> well, yes. Um, by personality and by character, I, I, I am a solitary person. And therefore, uh, when I was on the this political arena, that was only out of a sense of responsibility. I had to act as, as, that, as a minister, whatever. But so leaving the capital city and leaving that uh, center stage for me is kind of a getting back, becoming myself again. It's, um, for me, it's a very, very natural thing. Um, I don't think at all, well, yes, first of all, nowadays I live among far farmers. I live uh, in a mountain facing the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, only occasionally I go to Taipei and only occasionally when I'm really furious and angry, then I, uh, I voice, uh, I, I talk about current affairs, but usually I don't. At the moment, yes, my, um, I am more concerned with uh, what I consider even more quintessential issues of, of being, of existence, considering, for example, the relationship between man versus nature that occupies me as something very, very fundamental. Um, and Barbara, actually, uh, when I write an, a piece on nature, for example, I would have readers coming up and, and, and kind of a, in a loving way protesting. Um, look at the national affairs mess. Why are you not speaking up? You're not doing your duty, you know? It's your responsibility, isn't it? I have to tell you that I, I consciously resist temptation of playing a certain role simply because that role has brought you fame, uh, or simply because you want to please those who applaud you and you need the applause, I don't. So I resist that. I think uh, responsibility is something in a free society is self-imposed. And, um, and, and, and if you take on the responsibility and you speak up, and then you are fortunate enough that you are heard then you become recognized as a public intellectual. But I tell myself that I am only responsible basically, essentially, quintessentially to myself, not to anybody who happens to be on the wrong side and uh, hoping you play the same role. Um, no, I go with my own flow. 
So being a loner is being yourself in a way, right? Yes. So it's, yes. it's not yeah. taking on a certain position that a Chinese public intellectual also has the possibility, like Zhuangzi, who speaks of the turtle, which uh, prefers, you know, to to basically have the tail in the mud uh, than to be glorified uh, by some kind of ruler, right? Um, who worships. Yeah, but I, I try to resist <laughs> that temptation. <laughs> Right. I resist that. Yeah. Right. But I mean, tell us maybe a little bit about the Longing Thai Foundation, which mm -hmm. uh, while you are retreating to the countryside is still doing a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah. a lot of public work. Uh, no, I'm not retreating to the countryside. <laughs> um, no, Albert, I'm serious. It's that serious. You know, speaking of countryside in Taitung uh, at, at the Pacific, okay, I live in a, in a native village. And I live among farmers. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. I live among farmers. You know what happens when I listen to weather reports on the TV? I get I get angry. <laughs> because because when I listen to the, 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 the weather reports and the reporter, the presenters on TV news in Thai situated in Taipei, and they would lament saying, oh, it rains again, and, and that makes life so miserable, and it's so hard, and it rains so, so much. But you know, the farmers around me, they are heartbroken when there's no rain. They needed the rain. They were celebrating how fun the rain comes. And then these reporters in the center are lamenting the rain is there. And then another instance, for example, the reporters would say, oh, what a beautiful, nice, warm winter we have. And now the, the, the lychee uh, orchard owners around me, they are heartbroken because when the winter is so warm, the lychee flowers, the blossom, they will not bloom. Mm -hmm. They do not bloom, which means come summer, there's no fruit, there's no lychee, which means they have no income, which means they cannot pay for their children to go abroad. And, and, and therefore, by moving, I'm not retreating, I am moving to from that type of center to another type of center, which is called by the city people as the peripheral. And, and I think you have to be able to, you have to, to, to be aware your center is not the only center. And when you only have the perspective of the so-called center, you got a very warped view of the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm not retreating to the whatever I uh, I'm in a different center. <laughs> but what is what are the major challenges as a writer from the countryside rather than as a Today, writer yes, in the I'm, capital? I am in trouble, uh, uh, Baba. I am in trouble. You know why? <laughs> uh, the challenge for me at this moment, every day, is concentration. I need concentration, a really high level focus to write, but I am so infatuated with the big mountains and the endless Pacific Ocean, which is right at my doorstep. I wander and I explore and laze around. I look at animals, I see insects. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm in such a situation with nature that I'm not sitting down to write. I am not, I'm being not productive. That's my challenge today. <laughs> okay. Now, I put on the camera, you know, night camera um, around my garden inside and outside. <laughs> and, uh, and I called, and then I filmed the animals which appear in the middle of the night, the wild animals. Okay, so from wild animals, we go back to where we began with wildfires. Um, before we open mm -hmm. um, to the audience for questions, um, I want to um, uh, recall your reminiscences about writing your wildfire essays, risking your life on the white terror. Um, when you said in an interview in the fall of 2021, that when one is in the tunnel, it is not possible to know how close the light actually is. You know you're in a tunnel, but you don't know how long it's going to go. But you ended up in that discussion, you ended up arguing that after all, all tunnels have an exit and that therefore we have to keep that flame in our heart and not let it die down. 
um, sort of like Lucien in the in the Iron House fable, right? Even wake those people up, even if there's hardly a chance that they can live. So are you saying that even today, literature and the writer has an important role to play in the world? Uh, do we need more wildfires? Um, or put differently, do or should we have more wildfires? Um, first of all, Barbara, you made me more brave than I really was. <laughs> I mean, a lot more writers, intellectuals before me, they really ended up in jail and some of them died. Mm -hmm. So I was nothing in compare with what they have contributed. I was nothing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, speaking, I know, I, I know that what I said about, you have to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was talking to the millennials. Um, you know, the older generation, I think they have a right to become cynical, become disillusioned because they, uh, they have seen so much and they probably have been disappointed so many times. And very importantly, they have contributed when they were young. But, but now is the turn for the millennials to create their own time and space. What right do the millennials have to, be, to speak of being disillusioned or becoming cynical? or to believe that there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Your life hasn't begun yet. Um, and so, and when you, when you are young, then you have the privilege to, to dare to dream, so to speak. And you have the privilege to shape things and bring the world as close as possible to, to your ideals. Um, and so, so for, for the millennials, yes, you, there is no way out. You have to believe there is light at the end of the tunnel, of course. Um, and then to the question, I think, Barbara, that's a very important question. You, asked, you said that is literature still important today? Um, it's very obvious, obvious that literature can be a weapon against human follies, against political madness. But I think literature is far more than that far more. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to think as long as three things still exist in this world, literature will continue to thrive and be important. The three things are time, love, death. Can you imagine our world without these three elements ever, time, love, death. As long as these three elements are still there, like sunshine, like sunlight and air and water, literature will always be relevant. Literature will be always be important, always. And wildfire, do I, uh, do I have, do I dare to have more wildfires? Oh, absolutely. Um, only on a different plateau. in literature. Okay, now I, I will open the floor um, after thanking you profusely for um, uh, what you've already um, said, the, the note of hope in which, uh, on which you, you ended. Um, and I already have a question by Yu Jiang, and I, I would suggest that maybe for the question and answer session, it what might be nicer to have a full view of everyone rather than have oh. the two of us pinned, um, if that's yeah. okay for everyone. And, and please, those of you who uh, would like to ask questions, um, please make yourself visible as well. And I know that Yu Jiang um, uh, has already um, uh, put a question in the, in the chat and please raise your question. So tell us a little bit about who you are, Yang, um, before uh, you raise your question. Yu Jiang, can you make yourself seen? No, you're in the library and you cannot speak. Okay, so then I, I will, um, I will uh, read the question to Ying Tai. Uh, Yu Jiang is asking, I would like to put forward a question regarding mutual tolerance to each other. Personally, I think public opinions on both sides are somehow manipulated by politicians and the opinions have been polarized, which tighten the relations across the Taiwan Straits. The mainland has definitely her own responsibility 
to loosen the intensity, but I still wonder what and how Taiwan can contribute to the desiring of peace for people at both sides of the Taiwan Straits. Besides, with regards to battling with lies, does the young Taiwanese generation need to cope with their stereotypes about mainland? And how do you value the freedom of speech in Taiwan in relation to the freedom of speech on the mainland? Okay, that's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> Go ahead. Can I, can I ask the, the, the viewers or readers to restrict your question to only one right. question? Otherwise, I lose, I, lose, I don't remember. Well, I grow old. Okay, maybe so. So the first question was uh, the opinion, public opinion on both sides of the Taiwan Straits and the prejudices on both sides on the Taiwan Straits. Okay, uh, listen. Um, as I said a while ago, I mean, politicians lie. Uh, the state lies. Um, they lie in an autocracy. They lie in a democracy, only in different ways. So um, people in an autocracy, um, it's hard for them, like I was in the, in the uh, Taiwan under martial law, you have to get out in order to have a truer sense of reality. Um, it's for the, for the Chinese people on the mainland, it's very complex because they are both blinded by the firewalls. And at the same time, they have a strong urge and quest to, to search for knowledge. Many of the, the Chinese on the mainland know that they are not being told the whole truth. So, so when, while they are blinded by the state apparatus, at the same time, they also have a strong sense of looking for a different, different version of things. Now, the danger for the Taiwanese people, I would say, um, what happens is Taiwanese consider themselves living in a free society, and therefore, it's easy for us to become smug and overly self-confident well, because this is the open society and democracy, and therefore anything that I read must be true. It's not true. There are lies in a democracy as well. For example, uh, what you think you consider is news, actually is bought news. It's not news. So in other words, for striving for peace, uh, you really need to, to work for um, to form a critical mass, whichever system you are in. It's so important, it's so critical. And, and second thing, um, I was very impressed when I read about the intellectuals in France and in Germany, different part of, <clears throat> in different parts of the, uh, uh, the world during the First World War, when the First World War broke out, and the two countries were dead enemies. And the intellectuals from these enemy states, they would speak up and said, we do not, we are not enemies. And we are not going along with the state treating the other as enemies. That takes tremendous amount of courage. And I hope to see that across the Taiwan Strait as well. to try and fight against those prejudices. We're actually trying to do this with the Taiwan Lecture Series here in Heidelberg. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that um, most of the students attending the Taiwan Lecture Series are from the mainland. And so that, you know, that they learn a lot about Taiwan from, you know, Taiwan scholars or from uh, Taiwan writers and Taiwan uh, artists um, in order uh, to, uh, to promote that kind of, you know, understanding, listening to each other, like uh, Ying Tai was, was saying earlier. I, I hope the lesson that the Chinese speaking world will learn from the, the Russia-Ukrainian war today, I think, that I hope the one lesson that we should learn is not how Beijing studies uh, the failure of the Russian army and therefore they should do otherwise, or the Taiwanese should learn um, uh, what uh, 
what resources you should put in your cellar uh, in case of war. I think what we should learn is to learn from what the horrible things that's happening today in front of our eyes, how we should prevent that happening across the street. We don't kill. That has to be the major lesson from today. There is a question by Ross Chung. Uh, Ross, can you ask the question yourself or should I read it? I'd rather you read it yourself, but if you don't want, to, <laughs> this is the question on the flowers on Da Wu Shan. Da Wu Shan is oh. the, the last book that you have written. Um, yes. at the foot of Da Wu Shan. There we go, Ross. Go ahead. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. Hi, Ross. Um, hi, um, I'm Ross from Hong Kong. Very hi. lovely. I always uh, 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 grateful to uh, to read your books. Okay, let me be brief. Uh, how is the forest in Dao Shan? And talk about the nature. Can you talk about what's going on in Taiwan about the nature? Thank you. What's happening to nature in Taiwan? On Dao Shan. What what is what are the flowers <laughs> on Dao Shan? <laughs> uh, in oh, I'm glad you like Dao Shan. <laughs> um, some. Uh, some crazy fan has done the statistics that in this novel, there are, it's mentioned, there are something like 160 types of plants and 100 types of animals mentioned in the novel. And most of them are indigenous to uh, the, the, the Dao Shan. And so, um, um, it's a novel, but by, by depicting that wonderful natural world, I also like my readers to, to learn to appreciate mm. what's right around you. You know, they are so precious, but you never think about it. You never bother to even know their names. You know, it's the Chinese um, uh, tradition. You, it used to be when uh, when a writer writes about a plant, uh, he or she would write an unknown flower on an unknown tree. Why? And why do you why do you tolerate that? Why unknown? Why don't you find out what's what's their name? What plant that is? Why always unknown flower? It's not more romantic to call them a flower unknown uh, and a tree unknown and a mountain unknown. Get to know them. They are there. So anyway, uh, are you I'm writing? To, to do this is not eco criticism. I don't think your new type of writing is eco critical, is it? So it's 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 sort of for the environment, but maybe for more of an awareness for the environment. Is that it? Yeah, uh, has many many uh, layers of <laughs> uh, of metaphors and. Uh, and meanings in there. And did you say you're from Hong Kong? Right? Yes, Chung. yes, 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 okay. yes. Think about, think about the beginning of the novel, why I started with Hong Kong. Think about it. It doesn't have to be in terms of structure, but it did. Anyway, the secret is I'm paying my very private, personal, secret homage to the Hong Kong I love. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. And I, thank, I, you, sir, I, thank, thank you. you. I continue with someone from Hong Kong, Pato Yen, who is a writer himself, a dramatist, um, and who's asking, uh, Pato, would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, oh, yes, okay. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Yes, uh, uh, it's great that Barbara invites me to be here, yes, to uh, and to listen to Professor Long's sharing. And I think uh, you mentioned a lot about the politicians' lie and and... And what I ask is, how can we build politics with hope again, say, especially in this turbulent time? And also, do you think we say, okay, if all politicians lie, and then, okay, do you think we don't need politics anymore? Or how is your vision as a writer? Yeah, that's something I'm interested in. Thank you. So if all politicians lie, should we just basically get rid of politicians? Yeah, get rid of all. <laughs> do, you mean, do you mean that? Because if I infer, okay, if all politicians lie, okay, and then we don't need, need politics anymore, and then we just go get away, okay, just go to countryside? Are you, are you in this kind of vision? Yes, I'm interested. 
Thank you. And obviously not. <laughs> uh, yes. Or you have to assume all politicians lie. And therefore, then, the, then what follows that is not that, so we don't need politicians anymore. What follows should be, and therefore, we have to, have, we have to be ultra critical of who we elect, who we choose to form the government. And you have to be always on the alert. You have to be always watching out. That's it. We need them, but uh, we, need to, we need to have a critical mass so that the politicians um, will be afraid of being exposed. So Welf Werner um, is uh, bringing you back to your US experience um, thinking about politics. Welf, do you, would, you, would you like to raise your question yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for this very insightful uh, uh, conversation. I I'm, I'm, would like to get back to your US experience that you mentioned a couple of times. And my question is, are there any aspects of American culture or democracy that have impressed you in a distinctly either positive or negative way so that you have made use of them in your work? Are there any US influences in your work? Um, you lived there for eight or nine years. I, I'm sure you followed also uh, the development of democracy and culture in the US in, in recent years. Well, my American experience has had a huge impact on my intellectual growth, definitely. And it also has an imp even has an influence on my writings as a stylist as well. For example, for example, um, when I read Emerson, for instance, the transcendentalist from 19th century, uh, I was very young, 23, when I came across his writing, and, I, and, and Emerson said, when your writing should be like, you pull out the, uh, the roots of the dandelion, and the language should let the reader feel as concrete, as real, as if you use your hand to touch the roots of the dandelions that you just pulled out from the earth meaning that the earth, the soil is still moist, attach the roots of the dandelion. I think I remember this, something like that. That impressed me. No, we don't hear you. Very much. And you can see from all the writing I did until today. So that is personally a huge impact. Uh, let alone to speak about, um, especially I appreciate, you know, even under Trump time, when everything was incredibly, uh, it's kind of a uh, dystopia kind of time, um, the, 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 the American intellectuals, the, um, they, they were, how they reflected upon themselves, how, how, how they did uh, soul searching of what went wrong, where are we going? This kind of uh, uh, self-reflection is so crucial to a democracy. And that is something I absolutely appreciate. However, <laughs> however, it comes to the to Europe then. When I went, when I left the US, and later on, I went to, I, I, in 1986, I moved to Europe, first in Switzerland, and then to Germany, and when I went to Europe, I still had the baggage of me. The, the American experience represents the Western experience. So the America it is equivalent to the West. Then when I landed in Europe, it's kind of a, I was hit by a stone because it's so different. <laughs> it's so different. So gradually uh, I realized even in Europe, I mean, the German-speaking Europe, the German-speaking part of Europe, is so different from the French-speaking part. is so different from uh, from the the Saxon English from the English. Um, 
it was um, it was eye opening learning that so called West is not one thing at all, and um, the American experience is one thing, and the European experiences is totally different thing. So, uh, great learning experiences for me. So maybe we can continue with a question by Lumin. Uh, as you're talking about all these different European and other uh, experiences, um, Lumin asks, how can people in China be weaned a bit from nationalism to respect more individual freedom? And this can be asked about the US, this can be asked about different parts of Europe. How can people be weaned a bit from nationalism to respect more individual freedom? Through the education of critical thinking, I mean, nationalism by itself is not by nature a bad thing. Nationalism um, can be something purely natural. When you watch a soccer game competition, Europe Cup, and when you get excited over the winning of your own team, that is one exhibition of nationalism which is perfectly okay, but when not only when nationalism kind of uh, corrupts into tribalism, corrupts into uh, exceptionalism, corrupts into exclusiveness and chauvinism, then it becomes perverse. Um, so one has to make distinction uh, between what kind of nationalism Uh, what is holding up Ukraine now is their type of nationalism at the moment. So nationalism is also something is a baggage with many things in there. Um, with China, it's it's hard for me to answer because because you might you might want to say well, and the majority of the Chinese are. Uh, brainwashed and they are they they take whatever the government wants them to think but i don't dare to claim this because when we see what is so-called public opinion when we look at all the voices uh, of the self and home i was attacked by them a lot of times but how do you know how to, to what extent are they the true voices of the people and how representative they really are of the reality of the minds of the Chinese, one does not know, one does not know. So yes, everybody needs to be weaned from the perverse type of nationalism. Everybody has to learn, has to have a critical sense and to, oh, we're missing to make you. difference between the healthy nationalism and the perverse one. Uh, it's not only the Chinese who need to learn the lesson. Good. So um, I know that there is many more questions. Um, I want to um, wrap up with Isha Zhou's um, question on uh, whether Chinese from the mainland and from Taiwan who are outside of China and Taiwan, whether they should and how they should speak up um, to, to speak the truth about their two countries. Um. I think there are a lot of young people online mm -hmm. in this room with me today now. Um, I actually do think you or we have a responsibility towards peace. If you look at history, we, we have thought after World War II, something like what's happening today is totally out, but It did come back. Um, so then you, you have to, I, I think we have to really reflect about this. So are there moments where efforts should have been made, but they are not? Just like when I when we look back at the, the, the history of cultural revolution, we naturally have to ask, how did it come to this? Were there critical moments if, if you do something, if you had done something, and then if more people had done something, 
And if we had done something collectively, then the course of history might have been different. And I, when I read about German history, I always wonder, from 1933 on, when Hitler was just sprouting up, were there different circumstances and moments when people should have spoken up and missed the chance? And then history went into the pit. And nowadays, especially with the millennials, and especially if you are free to speak, you are not in Taiwan, Taiwan has its own problems. And if you're not in China, and the problems are very obvious, if you have a, you are privileged enough to have a voice, cultivate your voice, and um, try to bring a difference. I want to have a story, um, a very short one. So when the German, do we have to cut to the right now? Then I'll cut the story. Go ahead, tell the story. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> we, Sorry. we will wrap up. Uh, after. <laughs> I, have a, I have a girlfriend. Uh, she's 89 today, a German. And uh, she's a Guimi of mine. Um, she actually was born and grew up in the Polish part of the territory. She was the, the, the German descendants living there. And when, um, when, the, German, when the Nazi army uh, occupied Poland, um, her father ran a uh, photo shop and the Jews and the Poles and the Germans, they knew disaster is, is, is brooding somewhere. So everybody with the whole family were lined up in front of her father's photo shop waiting to take photos because they knew when the war comes, when disaster comes, you want to have a photo of the whole family together. And she said her father was inside, was taking photos. You know, at that time, you, you had a black cloth under you, you see, and you were taking photos. Uh, they, they heard uproar outside, fighting um, in the line, waiting outside. So her father went out to look and outside to look, what's going on? Why are you fighting? It turned out the, the Germans, German Poles standing in line were saying to the Jews who were standing in line, saying that you should go to the back and we should go up front. And you know, at this moment, you know what her father did, the photographer. The father stood there with a poker face. He himself spoke German, he was a German. He said to the crowd, especially to the Germans who were making a scene, saying that if you do not stand back as where you were, I will kick you right out. And you have no right to tell anybody to receive their seats to you. Um, I'm telling you a story in answer to the question you raised, meaning that what can you do today? Don't think that you are just Mr. or Mrs. or Miss Ordinary and there's nothing you can do. Yes, I think in our daily life, there are small decisions to be made every day. And those small decisions are important decisions. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. There were other questions, but we have to wrap up. And I want to hand over um, to Velf again after thanking you profusely. I think especially this word of hope in the end and also a nahan, a call <laughs> to arms um, to everyone um, who dares to do so, go ahead and do so, I think was very, very important. Thanks very much, Ying Tai. And I hand over to Velf for the final uh, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Long Ying Tai, for a very insightful uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Barbara. Um, thank you uh, to our audience for uh, very interesting questions. And uh, thank you so much for this word of hope at the end. Um, 
I would like to uh, end this session uh, with uh, the wish that you stay tuned uh, to the encounters. The fifth event in our encounter series will take place on Tuesday, July 26th at the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies. Our guest will be Pat Tu Yan, democracy activist from Hong Kong and writer in residence at the uh, Nationaltheater Mannheim. Thank you.